All right. Welcome to session two of this conference, Empirical Asset Pricing. Uh, we have three exciting papers about cyber risk, deep learning and asset pricing and asset pricing with realistic crisis dynamics. The first talk is about the cyber risk premium. There are 20 minutes for each talk, um, around 10 minutes for discussion and Q&A. So without further um, delay, I will give the floor to Pian Yang from um, Michigan State University. You have 20 minutes for the presentation. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I'll share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, that's fine. Okay, uh, great. Uh, thank you for uh, this opportunity to present our joint paper. Uh, my name is Chen, uh, I'm from Michigan State, and I'm a fourth year PhD candidate. Um, two of my co-authors, uh, they're my professors, my friends, uh, Hao and Naveen. Uh, there sh they should be here. Um, you know, if you have any questions, they should be happy to help uh, answering those questions in the, in the discussion. So um, as the name suggests, So um, you're aware that cyber attacks are increasingly severe. Um, you know, we have many prominent incidents in the past, uh, including in 2017, we have Equifax uh, data breach, which exposed um, over 147 million people's uh, personal uh, information. And more recently, last year, um, you, know, you all know that SolarWinds uh, breach, right? Um, it's, you know, impacting uh, not only corporations, but also government agencies. Uh, these are uh, really uh, interesting, severe uh, system disruptions. And particularly uh, around this time, because more businesses, entities, and uh, as long as um, you, know, you have data in the cloud or um, stored in, in a digital format, you are susceptible to cyber attacks. You know, um, you know, cyber attacks can be defined very broadly, uh, including you know, hacking, malware, or you know, phishing. Um, you know, you're probably uh, uh, very familiar with uh, with phishing attempts, as you know, universities are often targets of uh, phishing emails. I myself have received many, many phishing attempts uh, through our uh, school email system, so it's it's there uh, prevalent. So uh, for investors, it is very critical. For them to anticipate, you know, from the corporation side, uh, the cyber riskiness of firms, how they uh, can adjust their portfolio holdings, and you know, if they want to head the risks accordingly, um, upon their estimation of cyber riskiness of, of firms. So, uh, hence uh, why we study this uh, phenomenon. And the literature uh, has been growing. Uh, one strand uh, basically studies the impact on firms directly. Uh, for example, um, uh, Camia and all, uh, they show that shareholders suffer wealth loss around cyber attacks. Basically, they run event studies around the cyber attacks. They found that, uh, uh, on average, uh, firms that suffer, uh, you know, negative 1% of normal returns around events. And also, there might be information leakage and insider trading ahead of those uh, disclosures suggest that, uh, you know, part of the uh, players in the market, they have superior information about this and they can trade accordingly. And also, uh, cyber attacks uh, might potentially increase firms' cost of debt um, in the form of the spread uh, you know, between uh, their corporate debt uh, you know, cost and uh, you know, government debt. The uh, second strand, there's a second strand that studies the uh, potential systemic impact. You know, uh, they examine especially uh, 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 really recent paper they examine that the cyber risk as a global concern they examine the global market corporations when uh, where they use the textual information from earnings conference call and through that it, it developed a text-based um, firm level cyber risk exposure and sentiment as use uh, you know event studies and all, all sorts of as a pricing uh, gimmicks to find evidence that the risk is potentially systematic So we um, focus on cyber attacks as a difference differentiating uh, factor with the other uh, literature as a latent risk factor. And we employ machine learning methods to construct a ex-ante probability of firms 
suffering cyber attacks. So um, if we use a long sort of trading strategy with respect to our uh, cyber risk proxy, we earn uh, approximately 0.8% to 1% monthly alpha with P statistics uh, highly significant, uh, greater than three. And uh, if we run cross-sectional regressions um, you know, in the spirit of fundamental path, we find that risk premium is uh, pretty robust, even adding more uh, you know, firm characteristics and some of the anomaly characteristics to control for the tail risk. Um, and subsequently, we're also in, uh, you know, uh, interested in how in institutions uh, res uh, you know, respond to the uh, cyber riskiness of different firms. We find that over year over year, um, at the end of the year, they sell higher cyber risk stocks and buy low risk stocks. So, Did I uh, jump myself out? Yes, um, could you please start sharing the screen again? Okay, yeah. My network is not very stable. Um, who does this network? So um, yeah, we find external support for this uh, proxy. Uh, we aggregated our cyber risk index um, based on lagged market values, we found that this index, aggregate index, uh, strongly positively correlated with a external uh, cyber risk index, which is created by NYU engineering department. And also if we compare, uh, you know, our high minus low return series with uh, two very popular uh, cybersecurity ETFs, we find that there is a strong negative correlation with these uh, ETFs, which, uh, um, you know, give our external validation to, to the idea. So that's the preview of the results. So I first I'll talk about the data. Um, you know, prior literature use uh, private rights coloring house, a bridge data. Um, you can find it online. It's uh, relatively small. It suffers from the limitation that uh, the data is uh, you know, only up to you know, May 2018. Um, that the sample is small when you match the, uh, the universe of the data breaches to the country stat, you only get uh, around 300 unique events. So that's why we explore uh, some more novel data set. We find uh, uh, this data set on, on the internet. It is um, you know, provided by this uh, nonprofit organization called Identity Theft Resource Center, ITRC. So they basically issue annual reports on cyber incidents, um, you know, ever since 2005. And so we will pretend these uh, reports, which is in the form of PDF, from 2005 to 2019, we clean and matched uh, those incidents to public firms in, in CompuStat, uh, first by, you know, a machine fuzzy match, and then we manually uh, confirm these incidents and, and the match with the public firms. So this final sample actually consists uh, far more than the previous literature has shown that we have uh, 1,010 unique cyber attack on, on the uh, public firms. Uh, for US public firms, while um, 536 uh, are unique firms. Basically, uh, there are some firms that, ha that are uh, attacked uh, more, than, more than once. So this is a um, figure that plots the incidents um, uh, in our sample. So the blue line is the uh, unique incidents and the yellow line is the uh, number of unique firms uh, you know, for each year. Uh, so that's plus that start from 2005 to 2019. You can see that, you know, generally the, this is the up, upward trend, uh, although with, you know, some, some dips, uh, uh, ups and downs. So um, in terms of that, then we, we come to the, to the point that how can we measure cyber risk? So uh, there is no uh, broad or general definition of what a, a firm cyber risk could be. Um, so that's why we find it uh, more intuitive 
to, to define the subrisqueness sub as a um, firm's propensity or probability, ex ante, to be attacked in the coming year. So that's why we focus on a classification scheme. So, so um, but then we know, we all know that uh, from econometrics that we, we can run, you know, probe it or lodge it to, to uh, classify, you know, uh, the, the, the probability to, to estimate the probabilities of uh, these firms getting, ha uh, getting attacked. Uh, but then uh, they showed, we showed that these schemes provide a very abysmal predicting power out of sample. Uh, especially in, in this uh, setting. Uh, why? Because uh, we know that cyber attacks are, are very few, um, especially to disclose the cyber attacks are very few compared to the whole universe of stocks. Th this is essentially a uh, imbalanced sample problem. Um, that's why uh, the uh, traditional methods, they, they, only, they don't uh, really uh, show any effects. Um, and also, um, apart from that, uh, if you train the full sample using the traditional econometrics, you can do uh, look ahead bias, you know, using the full sample, and then also overfitting. Um, and also, uh, another uh, factor is that when choosing variables, um, such as uh, in the Academy of Paper, that they use firm fundamentals uh, accounting variables to to show the correlation between uh, you know these variables with the probability of getting uh, several attacks. But then uh, these variables have no parenting relationship with anything like cyber risky uh, because of their accounting variables. So uh, the, the ideal variable we want, we want to use is that to show that firm's investment or attention in some, some way in, their, uh, in the cyber security measures. So what do we use? So um, to, fi to, uh, to find the variable that can tell us uh, a firm's attention or, or seriousness about the cyber security, uh, we, we try to uh, use textual information from the firm 10K uh, disclosure, especially in the uh, risk factor section, because SEC requires that firm, uh, they disclose the uh, most important uh, risk factors in these filings. So we then uh, you know, explore uh, three different dictionaries with respect to cybersecurity, um, uh, NISC, NISACS, and cyber policy. Uh, two of them are government agencies. And especially the first dictionary was compiled, to, uh, compiled in 2006. So uh, really alleviates uh, the concern for look high bias. So we download all the, all the filings, clean them, and find 50, over 50,000 unique filings, uh, create you know, template variables using, uh, using the length of the risk factor section and the counting number of times the, the, the section mentions such as security uh, terms. So for, for the remedy of the um, imbalanced sample problem, we decided to use a heuristic from uh, Kian and Zen. It's a um, uh, rare events uh, logic model where they use a weighted uh, logic. So we use this heuristic to weight our class sample size to avoid putting too much weight on the majority class, which in this case is non-victim because, um, you know, the, the unconditional probability of getting cyber attack is only, you know, around single digits. So it's highly, highly imbalanced. And second, we, to avoid overfitting, we employ, uh, you know, a plethora of popular machine learning classification models you know, uh, Lasso, Ridge, Elastic Net, Random Forest, SVM, and each of which, uh, during the training uh, period, we use uh, cross-validation, where we tune the hyperparameters for the um, forecasting performance. And to avoid look at bias, we use recursive training testing procedure, which is to you know, use expanding training windows and a one-year one head testing approach, which can be visualized in this way. So the basically, you look from uh, the bottom left to, to the top right. Uh, you start from the year 2007, you have one year of training. Uh, so in, in the training, uh, the blue training period, we split data into training and validation, you know, find a, a best parameter and a, to use in the orange uh, window of testing. So basically for the orange uh, years from 2018 to 2019, we have you know, estimated the probabilities of uh, ex ante probabilities of cyber risk. So um, then it comes to performance. Um, did I include, okay, so the metrics. So the metrics, how to account for uh, how successful the model is. 
you know, we find that uh, the accuracy um, is proved to be, um, you know, not usable um, in this setting because of the imbalance problem. Uh, there is a large li literature in machine learning talking about the imbalance uh, learning problem that uh, accuracy is not reliable since, uh, think about it, if you have 100 uh, observations and 99 of them are on hats, uh, you can simply guess all of them are on hats or, you know, non-victims. Then you have a very high accuracy. So we decided not to use uh, the accuracy, but instead we use a plethora of different, very popular machine learning uh, metrics, uh, such as precision, recall, and f score. So the precision is basically, um, you know, out of all your predicted positives, how many of them are true positives. So the recall is out of all the true positives, how many are predicted, right? And f score is simply a harmonic uh, mean of these uh, two metrics. So, uh, we show here the mean performance metrics for our different, uh, you know, schemes or models uh, from our simple logit, which is a, the old econometric way, uh, using only accounting variables, and we then we add uh, the 10k variables, uh, and then we use lasso, ridge, laxity net, uh, running forest, linear SVM, which uses a linear kernel. And a general SVM, we uh, where we search through uh, different uh, kernels, and we find that you know uh, prominently, uh, you know especially judging between logit and the rest, we find that the, the simple logit doesn't find any victims. Actually, it could not find any victims using uh, you know only the um, accounting variables. But adding 10k variables, uh, there is a dramatic increase, but not much. But then using machine learning uh, methods, we find that especially uh, in terms of the, the recall um, um, of the victim, um, that uh, there is a dramatic increase in performance. And this is just to visualize a coefficient uh, matrices aggregated over all the time periods. You'll find that uh, it is best to have, you know, the the big numbers along the diagonal because uh, if you if you look at this way it, you could you could um, uh, this is basically precision and you look horizontally it's basically recall so it's ba uh, it's best to have um, the big numbers along the diagonal we find that you know using simple logic uh, cannot reliably find anything uh, any true uh, you know cyber attacks but using uh, you know weighted uh, you know, uh, class and also machine learning techniques, we find that um, the performance has been uh, pretty much uh, very greatly improved compared to the traditional methods. And then after we're getting all the estimations of the you know, ex ante probabilities of a cyber risk one year ahead, we can then run our standard uh, asset pricing test. You know, we uh, every calendar year end, we start stocks and form evaluated desire on portfolios for one year ahead cyber riskiness. And we find that high minus low return series uh, are highly significant, uh, produce highly significant uh, alphas across across all models. Uh, you know, even even the, the simple models. That uh, you know, uh, this is one of the evidence that uh, indeed um, high cyber risky stocks are. Uh, a price premium. Kian, and that is, you, have two, yeah. you have two minutes left. Yep. So, um, and then uh, it is not enough to show uh, that time series um, methods. And we, then we uh, also run cross sectional uh, regressions, uh, basically directly uh, from return on, you know, uh, various uh, firm characteristics. And also we include also some, some of the uh, tail risk variables that are shown to price, to be priced in market. Uh, you know, including asset, uh, asset growth and, you know, some uh, default O score and you know, all that. And uh, after you include all these uh, variables, we still find a very significant um, correlation between cyber risk and uh, cross-sectional return. And then we, we have the inst uh, institution um, because we think that um, uh, it's, it's a new risk and institutions have to learn uh, along the way, um, you know, how how firm cyber riskness uh, can be determined. Um, so we see 
So we want to see that how they, they can trade based on their learning of the subclass. Our intuition is that uh, at every year end, in institutions, uh, they summarize all the information they get from uh, the past hacks and they predict their own measure of sub-risk one year end. And in this, in this way, uh, if they trade uh, accordingly, they should uh, you know, sell the high risk stocks, buy low risk stocks, thus you know, uh, depressing the high risk stocks, which will be reviewed as a higher expected return in the future. So we basically use uh, an imbalance measure, which is basically number of net buyers uh, uh, minus the number of net sellers over the over the total number of institutions. Uh, the holdings change are similar enough. So these are the results. Uh, we find that indeed, over year over year, at the end of the year, institutions uh, sell cyber risk, high cyber risk stocks, and controlling for all the uh, you know. Um, characteristics and styles, and also I control for thetas in, in the last um, uh, specification. Uh, this is finally my class uh, cross-sectional regression across the years. Um, so um, this shows that indeed uh, they are selling high risk stocks, potentially uh, you know, pushing prices down and then revealing a higher expected return in the future. And then uh, after all this, you may find, you may think uh, that uh, I'm just finding, uh, they're just finding some mechanical every time prediction uh, you know, performance, but uh, that's why we want to uh, find some external uh, validation to our index. So first, we we found um, you know the two very highly popular uh, cybersecurity ETFs, uh, which should have negative uh, return correlation with our um, you know uh, sorted, evaluated uh, high minus low decimal returns because uh, they are in, uh, exactly in the opposite. So they should be the in the low uh, cyber risk uh, end of the spectrum. And these are two uh, popular holdings. You can see that these are uh, cybersecurity firms uh, and possibly uh, anti-malware firms. So this is the correlation. Um, I didn't show regression results, but the reg regression results are also uh, significant. So the return correlation between between uh, our sub-risk and uh, the ETFs are as low as negative 30%, uh, very strong. So that's one piece of evidence. The other piece of evidence is an external index compiled by NYU. So this is called Index of Security. It's compiled by uh, engineering department. And it is a monthly based, uh, survey based uh, weighted score index. So they uh, basically interview all these different uh, you know, professionals asking about their estimates um, about uh, the sub risk in overall. So uh, our hypothesis is that we should have a a uh, very positive correlation between our aggregated index with uh, this index. So our aggregated index is simply just uh, you know uh, using a uh, lagged market value of all the stocks that are in our sample, and um, you know times our uh, estimated probability of um, one year ahead uh, cyber attack. So we find that the correlation is very high, uh, thirteen percent, and positive. And also we separately run regressions with both detrended and not detrended, um, you know, uh, bare one year or one month changes in, in the index. We find that uh, also in the regression that the uh, correlation is highly significant and uh, positive. So uh, I've run out of time, but this is, um, so the conclusion, uh, I don't think I need to run through this. So basically we find a cyber index that uh, using machine learning uh, techniques to, um, to estimate the ex-ante probability of uh, firms getting uh, cyber attack. And find institutions do seem to adjust their holdings at year end. And this is one, one of the channel that uh, might lead to uh, expect a higher return in the future for high risk stocks. And we also find external validation for our index. And uh, thank you for listening. Great, thank you. Could you please stop sharing? Yes. Um, so the discussion will be me. So this is a very interesting paper. Um, and <clears throat> it looks at the question, is there a systematic cyber risk and what would be the risk premium? And the challenge in this paper is that cyber risk is hard to quantify. It's hard to quantify for a number of reasons. Number one, there's a lack of data. So we don't observe risk cyber risk directly to a large degree. Number two, it's a rare event. Fortunately, it doesn't happen that often in the data. 
So what is done in this paper is um, the authors propose to estimate the probability that a certain risk, that a, a certain company will be exposed to a cyber attack at a specific point in time. And then they use this cyber risk uh, probability as a proxy, as a characteristics in an asset pricing exercise. There are two methodological contributions. One is um, to use um, a regularized logic regression. So they use Lasso and Rich, among others, to um, estimate this probability of a cyber attack given a number of covariates. And the second methodological contribution is to infer uh, information from text data. More specifically, they count, they have a word counting from 10K reports where they look at words that are related to cyber risk. And overall, this gives them a data-driven approach to create and select variables that are relevant for cyber risk. Um, the empirical study is extensive and is applied uh, to US equity data from 2005 to 2019. Um, I like that they're using a new novel data set, the Identity Theft Resource Center, that to the best of my knowledge has not been used in this context, which gives them 536 different firms uh, to study. Um, they show that their cyber risk probability is actually predictive for future cyber attacks. Um, they can use this cyber risk proxy characteristic to um, estimate their risk premium for cyber risk, which seems to be significant. And then they can link this risk factor to economics. So they're, they're making a statement that institutional trading seems to avoid cyber risk. And they also show that cyber risk firms um, have higher ex ante cost of equity. So I like this paper, it's creative. Um, it comes up with a lot of novel solutions to a hard problem. Um, and I would encourage everyone to read it. Now have a couple of comments and suggestions which I hope can improve the paper further. And I want um, the authors to view this as constructive comments. So the first one um, is about the methodological part. Um, the main focus of this paper is to use the lasso uh, logistic regression, at least. Um, so I should mention that the slides um, are, are an updated version of the paper that I've received. So in the paper, the um, lasso regression had the main focus. And there was, and there seemed to be some confusion about variable selection versus got out of sample predictive fit. So lasso is not necessarily a good way to select what are the relevant variables in particular, if the regressors are correlated. For example, if you have two variables that are closed substitutes, Lasso might pick either of these two variables. It doesn't mean that the other variable is not relevant. It would still produce a good out of sample fit, but when it comes to interpretation of models, you need to be very cautious. So on a more fundamental level, the question is where is the sparsity when you try to map some outcome variable into a number of regressors? Um, if you have dependent um, um, explanatory variables, the sparsity might lie in a rotated space, like in a PCA space, for example. Um, another issue is that um, lasso type regularization estimators are not scale invariant. So it depends really crucially on how you normalize the data, and I couldn't find any information about it in the paper. The second part is about the cross validation. Now, again, it seems like the paper and the slides are slightly different in the way what they do. So I will refer to what I have in the paper. So their cross-validation was based on randomly sampling a subset of the observations to use them for prediction, and then doing different random samples. That's not appropriate with time series data because this is not IID data. So the right way to do it is to sample blocks, consecutive time blocks for estimation and for evaluation. Also, the number of cross validation folds is very application dependent, and I don't think it's right to cite some work in a very different area to, to choose this kind of tuning parameter. Um, also, in the paper, I had the impression that cross validation was used to not only choose the tuning parameters, which would be in the case of lasso the sparsity, uh, but the whole parameter vectors. And I think that's not how it should be done. Now, what I've seen in the presentation is this. Um, uh, local cross validation and then a rolling window for out of sample evaluation. So I have my doubts if there's sufficient data at the beginning of the window to make any meaningful uh, prediction, because keep in mind, um, a cyber risk attack is a very rare event. 
coming to the time horizon, and these are now comments related to asset pricing, um, it is what it is when it comes to when it comes to data availability. Cyber risk is a recent phenomena, so by construction, there won't be a lot of time series data. However, when we talk about risk premium estimates, we need longer time horizons. So this raises the question, do we actually have enough data to calculate mean returns reliably? Um, cyber risk should also depend on technological adoption and innovation. Um, at the beginning of the sample, less companies were digital compared to now, for example. This should also mean that exposure to cyber risk and potentially is risk premium is time varying. And so that is something the authors might want to think more about, right? So um, also the beginning of the sample includes the financial crisis. This was a very different economic situations from the last part of the data. And again, it comes to the bigger picture point of there's time variation and that needs to be taken into account, which it is not the current form. Now, so what the paper does essentially is proposes cyber risk as a new firm characteristic or to use it in asset pricing. Um, now, the way how they construct their cyber risk proxy or this propensity of a cyber risk attack is by a regularized logistic regression on a number of variables, which include many standard characteristics like size, age, intangible industries, etc. So the question is now, isn't cyber risk spanned by conventional characteristics? I think that's a key point if uh, you want to make a statement that this is a new characteristic. Because if it is spanned by conventional characteristics, then it might just, what you find, might just picking up some conventional risk premium. Um, and for example, when you run your pharma Macbeth regressions, you're not controlling for the characteristics that you use to construct the cyber risk proxy. So um, you, you control for some characteristics, but not age, intangible, et cetera, right? So uh, I think you need to do a better job convincing the audience that that is really something new. Um, and then there's a more fundamental issue. Your proxy variable, your propensity of cyber risk only measures the probability of an attack. If I think about what is the risk premium of cyber risk, it should be the probability of being attacked times the cost that this attack uh, has to accompany. Um, and that is completely neglected here. And the cost to, let's say, a bank, um, if their customer data is sacked, might be very different from the cost for a manufacturing company, right? Um, so you might want to think more carefully about this because that should ideally be reflected in your cyber risk characteristic variable. Last but not least, um, your sample seems to put a lot of emphasis on specific industries it means you might have a selection bias in your sample and that comes back to are you really picking up some new characteristic or are you just creating a very selective sample where certain characteristics are dominating and so you're just picking up those risk premium. Now, um, there are economic applications or um, that relate to the bigger picture. What can we learn out of this? Um, in the paper, you have uh, these regressions that should link cyber risk to institutional traits. Those have R squares of 0.2% in sample. So I'm not really sure if you are picking something up, even if in sample variables seem to be significant. I would like to see if you have actually predictability if you do an out of sample evaluation um, that would strengthen your case. And again, coming back to the bigger picture, um, cyber is so hard to quantify so do you think that investors can actually correctly assess cyber risk to get the risk premium? I mean, you need to go through a very challenging exercise to come up with numbers. And so I'm not sure if most investors can will do the same. Um, and again, the point is cyber risk is very hard to quantify, hard to estimate. It happens very rarely. Um, and I think the you're the selling point of your paper will depend very crucially on how strongly you can make a case that you can, number one, differentiate cyber risk from other known characteristics or sources of risk, and how precisely you can actually estimate the risk premium, given the short time horizon, given potential time variation, etc. But given all these comments, I just want to highlight this is a very creative paper, and it provides a solution to a problem that is actually really hard. Um, it's a novel, fresh ID and a novel ID in the fintech space, and I encourage you to read it. 
So thank you very much. And I also look forward to your answers. Uh, thank you, Marcus, uh, for these uh, constructive ideas. Um, and as you said, uh, the um, we have been updating the paper, so uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, Chen, yeah. would it be possible to raise your volume? Uh, your volume seems to be a little bit low. Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Uh, no. Yes, it's a little bit, okay. I think, on the lower side. Okay. Um, uh, is it better? Yes, much better. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm saying that we're updating the paper and many of the results might be slightly different. Uh, and also that uh, many of the issues that you mentioned should be addressed in the next uh, version of the paper. We're really happy. Um, you know, to send it to you if you have the if the time to, to read it through next time and um, you know reflect on the on the, on the new updates and uh, for you know scaling uh, issue that we should be clear we should have been clear in the paper that we do the scaling on the um, uh, training sample and we use the mean and standard deviation uh, obtained from the tr uh, you know training sample uh, to the test sample so there is no uh, information uh, you know pollution from from the test to the to the training training set um, and since this is doing recursively i think uh, they could um, partly alleviate the problem that you mentioned in the old version of the paper that used the you know full version and used the block uh, of the of observations to run the tests um, and uh, yeah i think the rest of the, the rest of the ideas are super helpful to us and we promise to to look uh, for solutions and uh, provide a better better version of the paper for you. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. I look forward to the updated version. Um, so the next presentation will actually also be by me. Um, and this paper is Deep Learning and Asset Pricing. And it's joint work with my PhD students, Yang Chen and Jason Zhu, both from Stanford University. And in this paper, we want to tackle one of the fundamental questions, asset pricing. Namely, why do we observe different expected returns for different assets? We know the answer to this question. It should be the exposure to systematic risk as measured by the stochastic discount factor or SDF. Now, as the fundamental problem is now to estimate this SDF. What is this object? Um, and that's a very challenging problem for a number of reasons. So first of all, the SDF should depend on all available economic information. That means it's a big data problem where a lot of variables are involved. Number two, this dependency on these variables doesn't need to be very simple, like linear. So this could also be a non-parametric complex functional relationship. And number three, dynamics should matter. For example, exposure to risk and the price of risk can be different during times of booms versus times of recessions. Now, machine learning methods might be quite useful here. And when I talk about machine learning methods, I mean methods that can deal with a large number of variables because they have a form of regularization and they can fit flexible functional forms because they're non-parametric. Now, the issue when we deal with um, financial, with stock return data is that we have a very low signal to noise ratio. If you want to predict stock returns, um, depending on the data set and the method, there's less than 1% predictability. That means it is this 1% portion that is the risk premium part that we want to explain. And what we propose here, and that's the key innovation of this paper, we include economic structure in a machine learning algorithm. So more specifically, we will use a no arbitrage objective function, and we will show that this pushes up the signal to noise ratio and helps us to find more structure in the data. Now, before I go to the model, I want to highlight three key challenges that we have to deal with in asset pricing. And I want to show how we are going to solve those. First is a functional form of the SDF um, based on an information set. And very popular and relatively successful models are linear factor models. An example would be the Pharma French five factor model. In that case, the SDF is a linear function of five factors and um, depends on the size, book to market, um, investment and profitability characteristic information. However, we know there's a whole factor zoo with hundreds of more potential characteristics. And also there's a lot of research questioning that the linear form might be misspecified. So our solution is 
a very flexible mapping for the SDF, and we can make statements about what is the functional, correct functional form and what are actually the right variables that we need to include. The second challenge is about test assets. It's a very important challenge that has unfortunately not received the attention it should in the literature. So we need test assets to evaluate what is a good or a bad asset pricing model, but we also need test assets to calibrate the parameters of an asset pricing model. Very popular test assets are the 25 double sorted portfolios of farm and French based on size and value. It's important to understand if you have an asset pricing model that can explain expected returns in these test assets, there is no reason why it should work on other test assets like momentum sorted portfolios, for example. So what we argue and what we do in this paper, we say the right test asset should be all stock returns and any portfolio that you can form based on these stock returns. And we are going to do this in a data-driven way. The third question is about the dynamics and more specifically the states of the economy. As I mentioned before, times of booms or recessions can be different from an asset pricing perspective. So we want to account for that. Um, and a simple way to do it would be to use NBR recession indicators. But that's obviously a very coarse way to capture the information because we have hundreds of macroeconomic time series with very complex dynamics. So our solution will be to extract a small number of macroeconomic states that are relevant for asset pricing using a very large panel of macroeconomic time series. So this paper will estimate an SDF using deep neural networks as indicated by the title. And the crucial idea is to use this no arbitrage condition as an objective function in the estimation. And we will not have one neural network, but actually three different neural networks, one for each of the challenges that I've outlined before. So we will have one neural network to map the SDF into our information set. We will have a second neural network to create the states of the economy. There will be a third neural network that generates the most informative test assets that we need to calibrate our SDF on. And these three neural networks are glued together by this new arbitrage condition. So I just want to highlight this is a very general model that essentially includes all standard models as a special case. Now empirically, our framework works extremely well. Now all the results I will talk about will be out of sample results, of course. Um, and one metric that we care about when we do asset pricing is the Sharpe ratio of the SDF, because we know that the SDF should be the mean variance efficient portfolio conditionally. Um, so our SDF has an out of sample Sharpe ratio annually for two, uh, of 2.6, and it holds for 25 years out of sample that's much higher than all the other benchmark models. At the same time, we can explain 8% of the variation in individual stock returns. And if you look at standard type of test assets, it means like standard sorted test assets, for all kinds of sorts, we have 90% or higher cross-sectional R squares. And that's much better than any other model. But we can also learn about the economic structure of the SDF. So surprisingly, uh, the SDF seems to be close to linear when we look at firm characteristics in uh, isolation. That means there's a reason why linear factor models are so popular, because as long as you only look at one characteristic, a linear model is not a bad approximation. However, there are nonlinear interaction effects. Uh, to give an example, small stocks are just different from small value stocks. And that is what we can find with our model. And I think that is one of the reasons why we perform so much better than for example, linear models. We show that macroeconomic states matter. And we also show that we get a surprisingly stable model over time. We only use the first 25 years to estimate our model. The next 25 years, we don't do any re-estimation and we still get this very good model framework. We can also make statements about what are actually the important firm characteristics in the SDF. If there's one takeaway of my presentation today, then it is that economic constraints matter in machine learning. If we take off the shelf machine learning models, they're not going to perform very well. Actually, an optimized linear model will work better than a deep learning model that has no economic structure. However, when you combine the flexibility of machine learning with the insights of economic structure, you can get very powerful models. And that's what we are going to do. 
I'm going to skip the literature review in the interest of time. It will directly go to the model framework. So we are looking at um, excess returns. That means uh, returns minus the risk-free rate of um, different assets indexed by I over different time periods. And the fundamental arbitrage condition implies that the excess return of an asset multiplied by an SDF, which I denote by M, has a conditional expected value of zero, right? That is the textbook no arbitrage moment equation. It's important that you have a conditional moment equation here because what it means is we can choose any variable that's observable at time t, put it into this conditional moment, and then we get an unconditional moment. So no arbitrage is just an infinite number of unconditional moment equations. So what we want to estimate is a CSSDF, and without loss of generality, we can get an SDF by projecting it on the return space. That means we want to find a portfolio of all assets that we have, all our stock returns, uh, where these portfolio weights are general time varying um, functions of the information set. Now note that this SDF portfolio should have the highest conditional sharp ratio, right? Now these portfolio weights, as I mentioned, are general functions of the information set. And I will split my information set into macroeconomic information like inflation rates, unemployment rates, GDP growth, et cetera, and firm specific characteristics that would be like size, value, momentum, et cetera. Um, and our SDF weights are this general non-parametric function of many variables that we want to estimate with machine learning methods. Now note that this conditional no arbitrage moments are equivalent to one factor model of representation. These are standard graduate textbook arguments. So excess returns should be equal to the SDF multiplied by an SDF loading, which is a general function of the information set as well, plus a component that does not carry a risk premium, a residual. So what we are going to do, we are going to SDF the SDF weights, which gives us the SDF portfolio. This allows us to estimate these risk loadings, which again are general time varying objects. And once we have those, we can run at each point in time a cross-sectional regression to get a residual. And then we can do standard asset pricing. So how is the estimation going to work? So remember, no arbitrage is given by this large number of unconditional moments. So we can use a general method of moment estimation approach. So let's say I choose what I call my conditioning function G, that is just in a function that apply to my information set to create these unconditional moments. So let's say I've chosen those. Then um, to do as an estimation, I can create sample moments um, and I can use in our case, a feed forward neural network to estimate the SDF that minimizes um, the deviations of all these sample moments that I have in the data. Okay, now the next part is important, so please pay attention. If you take excess returns, you multiply it by a conditioning variable that could, for example, depend on um, uh, firm characteristics, you're forming characteristic managed portfolios. One example would be a conditioning variable G that's an indicator function that is one if stocks are small and zero otherwise. In that case, you would try to estimate an asset pricing model that prices small cap stocks, right? So the question of choosing conditioning information in a GMM is equivalent to choosing test assets for an asset pricing model, or in econometrics, we would talk about finding optimal instruments. That's all the same object. And the challenge lies now in finding the optimal instruments to estimate an SDF. And we are going to use a so-called generative adversarial network approach to choose informative test assets. So how is this going to work? So let's assume we have chosen our test assets. Now we will estimate an asset pricing model that minimizes the pricing errors for these test assets. But now we have a second neural network, the adversarial or conditional neural network. Given an asset pricing model, it is trying to create test assets that we cannot explain very well. Right, so these are two networks now playing a zero sum game. Now my SDF network will be updated. It's trying to learn how to price the old and the new test assets. Then my adversarial network is trying to screw over the SDF network and tries to find mispriced test assets again. 
Now, this is just the research protocol that we have used in finance for the last 50 years, but we just did it manually. Let me give you an example. Let's assume that we propose an SDF that's a pharma French high factor model. My adversarial network might detect that pharma and French have given up on pricing momentum portfolios, so it might create momentum test assets. Uh, now, my new my SDF network might add a momentum factor to the SDF and so on. This will be repeated until convergence. So in summary, we are trying to find the economic states and test assets, which have the most pricing information. So just to clarify, in econometrics, people have thought about the problem of choosing optimal instruments and the standard argument is based on efficiency. Those cannot be used in this context for a number of reasons. So number one, we have a non-parametric problem with an infinite number of parameters, namely, this function for the SDF weights, and we have an infinite dimensional choice set for our instruments as well. In addition, we don't have these nice normal distributions for our estimators, so we cannot use the standard arguments. There's another point that is subtle and has been largely ignored in the literature, um, is about identification. All these GMM arguments assume that you know which test assets identify your parameters, and now you just pick those test assets that give you the smallest variance in the estimation. In reality, we don't know what test assets we need to pin down our asset pricing model. So identification matters. So our approach is based on robustness. We are controlling the worst possible pricing error. And we argue that's the right way to deal with the problem if uh, you have this large dimensionality. And if you don't know if your test assets are identifying your parameters. Are we done yet? Well, no, we still need to deal with the dynamics. So we want to condition on macroeconomic information. Now, most macroeconomic time series, as you know, are non-stationary. Just to give you an example, S&P 500 prices are non-stationary, they have a trend. Obviously, we can't use it. So what do we do? Typically, we take some form of increments. If I take log increments, I have log returns. That seems to be a stationary variable. Now, if you look at what to the best of my knowledge, essentially all machine learning papers have done in this literature, they use just last period increments as an input to some kind of machine learning um, prediction or asset pricing algorithm. However, last period increments are not informative because what matters are the dynamics. It means you need to understand what are the patterns that come out of using all past increments. I cannot infer if I'm in a boom or recession if I just look at last period's increment. I need to look at all increments. Now, the next issue is you cannot simply take one or 200 macroeconomic time series and take all their past increments, which could be a couple of hundreds as well, and naively feed them into a machine learning algorithm. You have too many variables. And you would not take into account that time as a structure. There's a specific relationship between these variables over time. So what we propose is to use a long short-term memory cell network to extract states. That means uh, economic states out of a large panel of macroeconomic time series. All of you have used LSDMs before, even if you might not be aware of it. So LSDMs are used by Apple Siri, um, Google's um, or Android speech recognition and Amazon's Alexa. So they're used for text data. And text data is nothing else as a time series that is quite complicated. So what LSDMs are going to do here, they will take this large panel, they're essentially extracting a small number of macroeconomic factors, and from those factors, they extract the dynamic patterns. And they will extract those patterns that are the most informative for our asset pricing objective, and that's what we're going to condition on to get the economic states. So just to wrap up, so that's the model framework. We extract economic states from large, a large panel of macroeconomic variables. We combine those with firm characteristics to construct an SDF. Now we have an adversarial network that also uses um, macroeconomic states and characteristics to create test assets that we can't explain well. We update our asset pricing model to explain those new test assets as well. And that's what we call our GAN estimator. So let me come to the empirics. So we have the standard data set where we have 50 years of US stock returns, essentially all um, stocks from CRISP, 46 firm specific characteristics, the usual suspects, 178 macroeconomic variables, 
all the relevant variables in this literature. First 20 years, we estimate our model, five years to choose certain tuning parameters, 25 years, full out of sample. So what are the benchmark models? So one benchmark model would be if we take our framework, but we restrict all functional forms to be linear. It turns out that we end up with linear factor models. We essentially would create long short factors and would form a mean variance optimizing portfolio with these long short factors. That would be one benchmark. Because we have so many characteristics, that means so many factors, um, and we know that um, creating mean variance portfolios with a lot of uh, variables uh, doesn't work very well. We also include a regularization, an elastic net regularization in this mean variance optimization problem. And this would be a model in the spirit of Kozak, Nagel, and Santos, essentially. The other extreme is to go all out machine learning, but without any economic structure. That means we would do forecasting. So we're going to use the best performing neural network from the Gu Kelling Shu forecasting paper. Now note, when you do forecasting, you estimate conditional means, and conditional means are proportional to SDF betas. So when you do forecasting, you're also estimating an asset pricing model. That means you can do asset pricing. So for all of these models, we get an SDF, we get SDF betas that allows us to get residuals. So we can calculate the sharp ratios of the SDF. We can square the residuals and average them over time in the cross section to get an explained variation. Or we first average these residuals over time to get an alpha, square that, and then get a cross sectional R squared. So there are just standard cross sectional asset pricing metrics generalized to our setup. So here are the main results. Um, so please only focus on the test results. These are the out of sample results. Our model, the GAN, has a monthly out of sample sharp ratio of 0 0.75, much better than the other models, where FFN is forecasting with neural networks, and the other two are the linear models. We explain twice as much variation, and we have 30% higher cross section R squared. And what I think is also interesting is that a linear model with regularization will do as well or better than if you do naive forecasting without economic structure. We can make statements what actually matters. So here I look at out of sample sharp ratio by including different types of information. Um, I can do what all other papers do and just include macroeconomic information as last period's increment without this LSTM. Um, out of sample, all models are going to collapse because last period's increments are essentially useless variables and um, you have too many useless variables in these models. If you completely leave out macroeconomic information, you get these out of sample sharp ratios. As a reminder, our benchmark model, the one I've presented on the last slide, is the very top bar. If you use not the optimal test assets, but you are just trying to price all stocks without forming these um, characteristics or the portfolios, you get the red bar. So this tells us you get a 20% increase by using this adversarial approach to create informative test assets. You have around a 10% increase if you use the economic states. Um, given SDF betas, we can sort all stocks into um, decile portfolios, high or low bet, and look at next year return. Our SDF betas um, predict future returns. Uh, so this is where the out of sample period starts and high bet, a higher future return, low bet, a lower future returns. So they do what they should do. But let me just talk about asset pricing now. Here I'm going to look at um, evaluated portfolios for all 46 characteristics that I have. So it gives me 460 test assets. I look at the expected return of these 460 portfolios and the model implied expected return. 45 degree line would be perfect fit. Our model is not perfect, but it gets the monotonicity right. All the other models like linear models or forecasting look more like a cloud. They don't really capture the cross section. Um, and we get cross section R squared higher than 90% for all of these 460 test assets. Um, now, we know our SDF works well, so what is it now? So our SDF is at times here, so we can look at correlations, spanning tests, et cetera. Just one result here is looking at, um, can we span our SDF with a pharma French five factor model? And as expected, we can't, neither can we span it with other factor models, right? Because asset pricing is more complicated. And one element of it is the functional form, and I'm going to wrap up now. Um, so 
Our SDF depends on a lot of variables. So it's hard to plot. What I can do is I can fix all variables at their median value, except for one, and then I can get one dimensional plots. So I can show SDF with a function of size or book to market ratio. We have it for all the other variables in the paper and these plots look close to linear. However, what is this functional plot? If I look at, um, if I take another second variable but don't fix it as a median. So what is the effect of size among um, uh, value stocks, that is the purple line, or among growth stocks, that would be the blue line. You see this non-linear effects. These are interaction effects. The same, what is the effect of value among large cap stocks or among, among small stocks? These are non-linear effects, and we believe that is the reason why we do so much better. There are tons of robustness te uh, tests in the paper, so we show our results are robust to market cap, they're robust to the choice of tuning parameters, they're also robust to the time periods that we choose, or if we use a rolling window fit, etc. So we believe we find a real economic structure. And so in conclusion, um, we bring a novel way of using machine learning techniques to asset pricing. The key insight is to use a no arbitrage condition, objective function to estimate our asset pricing model. And we add two important parts to the literature. One is adversarial networks to construct test assets. The second part is to use LSDMs to construct economic states. And overall, we will get an asset pricing model that performs really well out of sample. It allows us to learn about the structure of the SDF. It maps into investment strategies that are highly profitable. And in the paper, we talk that you can use this generative adversarial ID to also improve upon other conditional multi-factor models, for example. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the comments of the discussant. Can you hear me and see the slides? Yes. All right. Thanks a lot to the organizers for this opportunity to present this wonderful paper, Deep Learning and Asset Pricing by Liu Yang Shen, Marcus Pelger, and Jason Zhu. Um, I see that the paper is already in an advanced stage. So briefly, I'm gonna discuss the paper in the context of empirical asset pricing in general before moving on to the crux of it. So the paper in a nutshell is about understanding the cross-section of asset returns. Now, there were times when two or three factors were touted to be enough to understand uh, stock market returns. For example, the paper by Farmer and French, 1992, which we have all seen a thousand times before, says that two easily measured variables, size and book to market equity, combine to capture the cross sectional variation in average returns. That's the whole abstract of the paper. So uh, times were pretty simple back then. 25 years down the road, this table from Harvey and co authors, 2016, um, shows. Uh, the collection of all factors that have been proposed in the academic literature uh, to price uh, cross-section of asset returns. There is a total of 113 common factors, 202 characteristics factors, and some of the motivation for these factors date as far back as to sharp 1964. So the question is, what on earth happened in this 25 years and how did we arrive at this zoo of factors? There has been a quest for characteristic sparse factors to understand uh, and explain asset returns. Now, what do I mean by that? We start from a fundamental asset pricing equation, price equals expected discounted cash flow, where discounting is embedded in this pricing kernel or SDFM. We can equivalently write this uh, in terms of the excess return of stock, RE. And a common assumption in the literature is that SDF is affine in some set of factors F with corresponding weights W. Uh, an example would be the Pharma French three factors where SDF is affine in market, high minus low and small minus big factors with corresponding weights. Well, recently we've had Pharma French five factors, Barry Larson Shankin six factors in 2017, and you can see where this is going. So an important question is, can a characteristic sparse SDF describe the cross-section of equity returns in the first place? If the answer is yes, then lots of these anomalies are redundant. So let's go back to understanding what is the economic rationale for characteristic sparse SDF. Let's think of profitability and investment factors, which um, sprung in the literature in the past decade. These two factors come out of Q theory, which 
um, uh, says that an optimizing firm equates the cost of capital or the expected return to expected profitability and planned investment. Now, the empirical research uses observed productivity, uh, observed profitability and investment as a proxy for these expected quantities which are unobserved. So it's not far-fetched to think that these unobserved variables can actually be explained by potentially many other observed factors. That's the point make, uh, made in the paper by Kozak, Nagel and Santosh 2020 and the paper by Marcus is in the same spirit. So how do we move from a sparse SDF to a rich SDF? Earlier, we have the Pharma French um, SDF where M was simply a function of just three factors. This paper assumes a more general form. Uh, first, we project the SDF onto the return space, which is why we have the excess return on the right-hand side here. Omega are the weights, which, are, which can be time varying, and N can potentially be large. And the goal is to find the set of weights omega that can explain the asset return at time t plus one. Now, if we plug this into the no arbitrage condition, we can uh, solve for uh, weights in closed form. Now, these are the weights of conditional mean variance efficient portfolio. And asset pricing theory dictates that this is the portfolio with the highest sharp ratio. So it's not of it's not of interest just to the economists. A practitioner is also very interested in this SDF portfolio because they are always interested in building a portfolio with the highest Sharpe ratio. Now the problem is it's very difficult to reliably estimate uh, the inverse of this expectation. And the technique that this paper uh, uh, has introduced sidestep this, uh, this problem. So let's understand what is GAN. Marcus already explained in detail how GANs work. Um, we start with a conditional no arbitrage as a pricing condition, and uh, we knock off um, the conditioning term by introducing a function G, which is in the filtration T. What does that mean? G is a general function that captures all available information at time T, which we can use to predict the return at T plus one. Now, this naturally leads to the objective function um, in the GAN. So, in a nutshell, what GAN is, is G acts as an adversary and it says, you propose me an M, you propose me the set of ways that we can use to build the SDF portfolio, and I will go and find portfolios that are poorly priced by your proposed M. Uh, Marcus already uh, showed this example to us. If um, I propose Pharma French SDF M, then the adversary will form momentum portfolios because we know that um, pharma French factors cannot price momentum portfolios. So this adversarial game between M and G is repeated until we find the stochastic discount factor that prices all portfolios. What's really nice about this is that it's a purely data-driven approach. G can be a very flexible, um, G takes a very flexible functional form and it can incorporate both macroeconomic variables as well as uh, from characteristics. Secondly, this also solves the problem of hacking test assets. So we see that this uh, introduction of GANs into the no arbitrage asset pricing condition solves several problems than that meets the eye. One, it sidesteps the problem of inverting reliably a large uh, conditional expectation matrix. And second, it also comes up with the problem of, uh, it also uh, sidesteps the problem of uh, hacking test assets. All right, I just have a couple of comments. What stands out in the paper to me is the methodological contribution. How do we use GANs in empirical asset pricing and how do we embed them into the conditional uh, no arbitrage equation? Some of the results we've already seen before. For example, uh, we know how to, we know that machine learning can be embedded into no arbitrage condition um, from this paper by Go and Gothers in 2019. Uh, Kozak, Nagel and Santosh, uh, touches upon this fact that interactions between factors matter and we know that macroeconomic conditions matter. But what's nice about this paper is that it leverages this knowledge that we already uh, know before and it sort of imposes this in a big data framework to have powerful results in the sense that we see around 90% uh, R squared predictability which we don't get to see in the other models. And uh, another thing is, I think it's interesting to benchmark this paper against an auto-encoded asset pricing model by Gu and co-authors 2019. 
um, because that paper also uses neural network and embeds it into the NOAA arbitrage condition. Of course, they are looking for a sparse representation because they're using autoencoders, but I think it's nice to see if uh, this model can uh, beat the autoencoder model. Uh, second, these commands are minor, only uh, characteristics and aggregate consumption variables go into the uh, function G. Uh, I'm just wondering, there are other related factors like the consumption share of participants in the market or non-participants in the market or the wealth share of intermediaries. They are also shown to predict asset returns. My sense is that they could easily be incorporated uh, into the function G. So I'm just wondering why they've been left out. And another thing is that this GAN forces the stochastic discount factor to chase limits to arbitrage factors. What are these factors? For example, noise trader risk from the paper by uh, DeLong and Cortes in 1990 is one example. An economist is primarily interested in finding uh, factors that are related to predictability that is associated with this compensation. So I'm just wondering if this STF can disentangle these two effects and you know, help us find the interesting factors that economists are interested in. Uh, lastly, um, in an economy where there's no arbitrage and with that, when there are um, more than uh, just stocks, for example, if there are stocks and bonds, then HDF should price both of these uh, securities. And uh, I'm just wondering if this approach could be used to understand in coming up with risk pricing that is consistent in both uh, equity as well as bond markets or even uh, including option markets, because I think that's lacking in the literature, especially in the high dimensional setup. Uh, overall, I think it's a great paper with a very novel methodological contribution. I very much enjoyed reading it. Congratulations to the author. Thank you so much for the comments. I will be very brief in my answers to try to get back on schedule. Um, so first, I mean, there are very good and insightful comments. Uh, there's one thing, and I think there's unfortunately a lot of confusion what different models do and what uh, is going on. So take the autoencoder paper. So to be clear, we look at IPCA as a special version of autoencoder in the paper. And uh, number one, um, these are models that give you a set of conditional factors. They don't give you an SDF. That's a fact. There is no SDF coming out of it. You still need to find a way to combine these multiple conditional factors into an SDF. And how you combine this is tricky. And we show that GAN is complementary. So if you impose this assumption that my SDF needs to be spent by five or 10 factors that come out of IPCA or an autoencoder, you can use our GAN to say how you need to create this band based on the five factors, right? So there's no way to directly compare it because they're doing different things. Um, as a side note, um, I think a lot of people talk a lot about, oh, there's a no arbitrage model, yes or no. I mean, in the end, um, and there's some work I've done with Martin Leto about you, PCA versus PCA explaining mean returns. What really matters is that what you include in your objective function are mean returns. If you use a PCA-based paper that explains variation, um, it's not leveraging, leveraging the mean information, right? So it comes back to the autoencoder part. Yes, there is structure in post, it's correct, but there is no structure that really leverages information in the mean. I think that plays an important role. Um, the other thing, I really like the idea about explaining different asset classes at the same time, bonds, options, etc. And um, as a side note, we are working on models that hopefully soon come out in that regard. But what's important to understand, um, in asset pricing, you assume you have a set of characteristics that identify all information that are, is relevant for pricing that asset, right? You're not looking at the name of an asset, you say a stock that has these 50 characteristics is the same as another stock if it has the same characteristics. Bonds don't have the same type of characteristics as stocks. You cannot easily put them into the same model if what you use to explain risk exposure is firm physical characteristics. There is, we don't have the, in the different asset classes have different type of variables. And it would be nice to put them into the same framework, but it's not trivial and it requires actually much more modeling um, to make it consistent. But again, great comments. And I will now turn to the next paper, which will be asset pricing with realistic crisis and dynamics, which is presented by you. 
Okay, let me share my screen. All right, can you see it? Yes. Okay. Thanks a lot to the organizers for selecting my paper. I will present a surprising with realistic crisis dynamics. Uh, let me jump right into it. I'm gonna start off with, by showing some historical facts. This is a time series graph of um, evolution of investment rate in the blue line, estimated equity risk premium in the black line, um, the GDP growth rate in the gray line, and bank holding company leverage in this thick red line. What is shown in the background is NBER recessionary period. What we see here is that during bad times, during crises, GDP growth rate falls, investment rate falls, equity risk premium rises, and so does bank holding company leverage. Now, empirical um, uh, intermediary asset pricing literature uses this bank holding company leverage as a state variable to explain these dynamics. Now, there are different types of crises. What I'm gonna talk about today is financial crisis crises where intermediaries take a special role and where banking has significant dimension. A classical example of this crisis is 2008 crisis. So let's zoom in and see what happened there. The graph here shows the evolution of bank failures between the year 2001 and 2020 in the United States. The blue line here shows count and the red line is, uh, the dashed red line is in terms of default volume. Around 150 banks failed in the year 2009 which is a strikingly large number compared to a total of 25 bank failures between the year 2001 till 2008. Now, it's not a surprise that banks go bust during financial crisis, but the extent to which they failed is definitely surprising. One might argue that non-financial institutions also fail, so what's so special about banks going bust? But it turns out that in terms of default volume, around 80% of the Moody's issuer default in the year 2009 came from financial institutions alone. So where does the literature stand on that? The idea of financial amplification goes back to Kiyotaki and Moore 1997 and uh, Benanke, Gertler and Tilkris 1999. There are some special agents in the economy. We can call them as banks or intermediaries or experts. They all mean the same thing in this context and I'm gonna use them interchangeably. These guys are highly leveraged and they are financially constrained. So when an aggregate shock hits the economy, it hurts their balance sheet it hurts them disproportionately more than the others because they are leveraged. They start fire selling the assets. This depresses their net worth, which puts a further downward pressure on the price. And this two-way feedback loop is known as financial amplification. It takes a long time for these guys to repair their balance sheet and climb out of a crisis. So the key question that I'm asking is, how do we build a model that can quantitatively explain all these things? The objects of interest are time varying risk premium, output dynamics, leverage patterns, and the persistence of financial crises. So I build a macro finance uh, asset pricing model with financial amplification to explain persistent and amplified crises. There are two classes of agents, households and more productive experts. But the experts face stochastic productivity and they also exit the economy at a faster rate when there is a financial crisis. This assumption can be thought of a, a case where it becomes very difficult for hedge funds or banks to operate during crisis, so they close down their shops and become households. Such a model is multidimensional, and I'm gonna use active deep learning to solve it that encodes economic information as regularizers in the loss functions. And the second part of paper quantifies uh, my model and compares against a simpler benchmark model, where in the benchmark model, I shut off the variation in productivity and I remove the exit of the experts assumption. This model is basically Bruno Meyer and Sanikau 2016, but with recursive preferences. Now, I show that in this simpler benchmark model, there is a trade-off between amplification and persistence. In other words, there is a trade-off between how large a crisis can be and how longer a crisis can be. Basically, you can have one thing or the other, but not both at the same time. I'll show you how my model resolves this tension and provides a better match to the data. All right, in the interest of time, I'm skipping the literature review and I'll explain the economic mechanisms. There are two classes of agents, like I mentioned, households and experts. In good times, all capital in the economy is held by experts. And they, um, 
when experts hold capital, um, the aggregate dividend in the economy is high and uh, their balance sheet remain healthy and there is no financial amplification. There are two shocks in the model that generate crisis. First is a capital shock. When an adverse capital shock hits the economy, it hurts the balance sheet of experts disproportionately more and therefore their wealth share deteriorates. In other words, their balance sheet weakens and this leads to financial amplification because they start fire selling the assets. This generates larger premium and increases the price volatility. This is documented widely in the literature. And there are two additional things that happen in my model. P productivity shock is also positively correlated with capital shock. So in bad times, productivity of the exports also falls down. It becomes difficult for them to operate capital. On the top of that, some of them are closing down shops and becoming households. This pushes the economy deeper and deeper into the crisis. The only way to climb out of this crisis is for the productivity of the remaining exports to shoot up. But that will happen only slowly because of um, slow mean reversion and productivity. That translates to delayed uh, recovery and slow moving capital, which I call as persistence. That's the economic mechanism. The balance sheet is fairly simple. Both experts and households can operate physical capital. Um, there is a risk-free uh, debt market where experts borrow from households and invest in physical capital in a leveraged fashion. The key friction in the model is that experts are forced to hold some inside equity. That's the classical skin in the game constraint. If there is, if this block is absent, if this is just one full block of outside equity, then there is no financial friction and there is no amplification channel. As long as experts are forced to hold some inside equity, there is crisis in this model. Okay, the output follows AK technology. Y can be thought of as GDP. Um, the A is the productivity and K is capital. And I index J to mean households uh, by H or experts by E. Capital evolution is given by this stochastic differential equation. Z is the standard Brownian shock. Sigma is the volatility parameter that's exogenous. Delta is the depreciation rate of capital. Iota is endogenous and it's the investment rate and phi is some cost parameter. What's important to note here is that the iota, the investment rate is endogenous and it's linked tightly to capital price as a result of Q theory. In bad times, asset prices fall and therefore the investment rate falls. This drags down the growth rate of capital and eventually the GDP of the economy. So this is the link through which the asset prices affect the overall GDP in the economy. I assume that the productivity of households is constant, AH, but for the experts, it follows this stochastic differential equation. This is basically an onstein ollenberg process, but with stochastic volatility. The way to read this equation is that the productivity of experts fluctuates between a lower level, A lower bar, and upper level, A upper bar, and mean reverts to A hat at a rate pi. Importantly, the productivity shock ZA, which is a Brownian shock, is positively correlated with uh, the capital shock ZK. And the lowest level of expert productivity uh, is still higher than the household productivity. So experts are always better off in this economy, always more productive in this economy. It's just that during bad times, they are losing their comparative advantage that they hold over households relative sense. On the top of that, experts exit the economy, a fraction of experts just exit the economy at all times and become households. But as soon as the economy enters crisis, a larger proportion of them become households. This is a parsimonious way to capture bank defaults. It becomes difficult for banks and hedge funds to operate because of uh, um, various exogenous reasons. And this is similar to the assumption used in the paper by Gomez 2019. All right. Agents have stochastic differential utility in this model, which conveniently disentangles risk aversion with intertemporal elasticity of substitution. Um, the optimization here is very standard. Agents maximize their lifetime utility subjected to standard wealth constraints. The choice variables are consumption, um, capital holding, and investment. Capital holding can be thought of as just the portfolio of choice in a standard Merton model, for example. Okay, I'm gonna talk about the solution technique now. Now note that there is a continuum of agents in this economy. So their wealth distribution should ideally be the state variable. But 
each individual within the respective group, within the households or within the experts are all identical. They face the same optimization problem and as a result, take the same policy decision. So the wealth share of experts Z is enough to capture this wealth distribution. Therefore, I solved this model. Um, I solved for a Markov equilibrium in terms of two state variables. One is the endogenous wealth share and the other is the exogenous productivity of the experts. The way to think about the wealth share of experts is that it reflects balance sheet. In good times, the wealth share of experts is high, their balance sheet is healthy and they are sufficiently capitalized. And in bad times, it falls down and their balance sheet weakens. Okay, the way to solve this model is um, reminiscent of value function iteration in economics and finance. We start with a arbitrary value function, one for household and one for experts. And we solve for the equilibrium quantities. What are these quantities? The optimal consumption, optimal investment, optimal portfolio, capital price, and the return volatilities. There are two return volatilities, one associated with capital and the other with productivity. This block is static in the sense that there is no time dimension. It's just a system of algebraic partial differential equation in first order, so it can be easily solved using newton raphson method. Once we have this equilibrium quantity, we have to update the value function. So this has some relevance to reinforcement learning where, uh, reinforcement learning where there is policy evaluation and policy update. Um, this block, uh, once we solve for equilibrium quantities, we now have to update the value functions, which is just a system of partial differential equations, one for households and one for experts. Literature has used finite difference in the past in one dimension. I'm going to use informed neural network because this is a model of two dimensions. Why neural nets? Because it turns out that whenever state variables are endogenous and correlated and cross partial derivatives enter the PDEs, it becomes notoriously difficult to maintain the monotonicity of finite difference scheme. The paper by Davarna and Van der Weyer 2019 documents this phenomenon in a similar model. And they solve this problem by rotating the state space and solving for the right uh, direction to approximate the derivatives using finite difference. It works really well in uh, two dimensions, but it doesn't work in more than um, uh, two dimensions. Uh, the second reason to use neural nets is data efficiency. I'm only going to use 30% of the total grid size in order to train this neural network. This allows us to scale um, this model to higher dimensions very easily. In fact, in a companion paper, I showed that this technique can be used to solve a similar model, uh, which has a total of five dimensions. All right. So now we have to forget about this block because we already know how to use newton raphson method and focus on how to solve uh, the partial differential equations, one for households and one for experts. That's the next step. The PDE looks like this. These are the first partial derivatives with respect to state variable um, Z, A, as well as time. These are the second partial derivatives and there's cross partial derivative. The coefficient, the advection coefficients and the diffusion coefficients are all determined in the inner static loop. So we can just think of, think of them as just vectors of coefficients that we already know. This PD also has a linear term as well as an initial and boundary condition. So how do we use neural networks? We start with the most boring type of neural network, which is a fully connected feed forward neural network. The input neurons are space, um, are, are the state variables, well share, productivity and time. And output is J hat, which we hope would be a better approximation for this PDE. Of course, this is going to be a lousy fit because we have not used in, uh, any structure of the PDE yet. So that's the next logical step. I use automatic differentiation to compute the first derivatives as well as the higher order derivatives. And I build the PDE loss residual. This loss residual basically evaluates how far J hat is from respecting this partial differential equation. Now, the innovation clearly is not to use automatic differentiation here because that has been around for quite some time. But uh, the point here is to build loss functions using knowledge that we already know from the inner static loop. We also, we also have some boundary network um, where we embed the initial as well as the boundary conditions. Similarly, we use automatic differentiation and uh, compute these loss residuals. Now comes the active learning part. This model is um, similar to the other models in macrofinance literature is highly nonlinear. 
So in normal times, capital price is high, price volatility is low, and suddenly there's a sharp transition to crisis where price falls down and volatility shoots up. We don't have an a priori knowledge of where this sharp transition takes place, but it gets revealed in the inner static loop. So what this crisis network does is it taps into the newton raphson method. It learns about this subdomain omega c where the sharp transition takes place, and it samples more points from there in order to have a better approximation of the function in this subdomain omega c so that it can avoid instabilities in the future iteration. Now the subdomain omega c may change from one value function iteration to the next. Therefore, this crisis network actively at every iteration taps onto the newton raphson inner static loop door and asks where this subdomain omega c is so that it can sample more points from there and avoid uh, instabilities in the future by having a better approximation. That's the active learning part. I collect all the loss um, residuals and minimize um, the aggregated loss using a combination of Adam and BFGS method. Now, what I wanna emphasize here is that we can't expect to build a complicated model, put all the ingredients inside, throw Adam optimizer at it and expect things to work. Most often it's not going to work. This separation of fundamental network with a more informed network and active network allows us to peek into the so-called black box and understand where the algorithm's success or failure is coming from. For example, it turns out that the gradients coming from this particular bounding loss is much higher com compared to the um, gradients coming from the other loss components. Therefore, I attach a much lower weight to it in order to not let it dominate the other components. All right, a quick peek into the hyperparameter choices. I use four hidden layers to solve this model with 30 neurons each. And I use a tan H activation function because it's smooth and it's wonderful to solve PDEs. Uh, I use a combination of first order Adam and a second order BFGS because it works better to solve such highly nonlinear partial differential equations. And um, the learning rate I use is 0 0.01. And as I mentioned, I attach a much lower loss function weight to, the, to that coming from uh, the boundary condition. So I sample 30% of the grids, 30% um, of the points from the uh, total grid. And I use all of them uh, uh, for 5,000 epochs and training. So in that sense, it is full batch, but it's still only 30% of total grid size. All right, this is how the output looks like. I plot capital price as a function of wealth share. There is a normal region where wealth share is larger. This is the wealth share of experts. So when wealth share is high, balance sheet is healthy, and the economy is a normal region. Once it deteriorates and falls below 20%, crisis hits and the capital price falls. And due to the amplification two-way feedback effect, it keeps falling down until the economy recovers, uh, recovers and uh, moves out of crisis. Uh, this is just in a story of one dimension. We also have the other, the other dimension, which is the productivity of experts. So that induces additional time variation um, in, in the capital price. All right. So I quantify my model and compare it against a benchmark model, where in this benchmark model, I shut off the time variation and productivity, and I assume that the experts don't exit the economy. That model is Bruno Maya Sanikov 2016, which, which I denote as BS here. Okay. Um, I simulate both the models and I present key moments here. The column all corresponds to unconditional moments, crisis and normal correspond to crisis moments and uh, moments in the normal uh, period. The first three columns correspond to my, uh, my model and the last three correspond to the benchmark model. Lots of numbers here, but I want you to focus on the key figure, which is the risk premium. My model generates a total of 6.7% risk premium unconditionally, which is closer to 7.5% that I observe in the data. It also generates an amplified crisis in the sense that conditional on being in the crisis, it generates 17.5% risk premium. Now the benchmark model can reasonably capture this amplification, but it falls short on capturing the unconditional risk premium that we observe in the data. Secondly, due to the stochastic productivity, I have more time variation in the investment rate and risk free rate compared to the benchmark model. Lastly, and more importantly, my model can generate a duration of crisis of 17 months, which is comparable to 18 to 20 months that we see in, in BER. 
the benchmark model falls short and can generate only six months duration of crisis. What's important to see here is that the economic mechanisms of my model is such that it is possible to have both an amplified crisis as well as persistent crisis. Whereas in the benchmark model, you can have an amplified crisis, but you fall short on uh, persistence. Now, why does that happen? In the benchmark model, there's only one shock, which is an IID Brownian shock. So when the economy enters crisis, risk premium shoots up, experts earn this risk premium, they repair their balance sheet and they quickly get out. In my model, there are three key forces. First is that once crisis hits, risk premium is high. That's the traditional amplification channel. On the top of that, experts are becoming households at a much faster rate. So this is pushing the economy deeper and deeper into the crisis. And the only way to break out of the crisis is for the productivity of the remaining experts to go up again. But productivity is already down during crisis and only slowly mean reverts to the upper level. This slow mean reversion um, leads to protracted recession. What I show here is the tail of the wealth share distribution from benchmark model here on the left and from my model on the right. This line here is the crisis boundary. What we see here is that there is more mass near the crisis boundary. So the economy enters the crisis, it spends some time here and quickly gets out. Whereas in my model, this is the crisis boundary. Once the economy enters crisis, the exit assumption forces um, the economy to go deeper and deeper, and there is more mass in the interior of the well share. And after spending around 17 to 18 months here, the economy breaks out of the crisis because the productivity mean reverts to the upper level. That's the mechanism that resolves this tension. All right, I'm short of time, so I'm concluding. I've shown you that a model of stochastic productivity and exit generates realistic crisis dynamics, and I've used active machine learning to solve this um, uh, model, which opens up interesting avenues for future research. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And we have now the discussions. Can I share my screen? Yep. Okay, so um, this is a very nice paper. I have been enjoyed reading it. Let me jump right in. So the summary results is that paper builds a macroeconomic model that incorporates elements from previous literature, uh, especially Larson style with uh, the cited paper that uh, the author mentioned, and also using an exit uh, rate of the expert in the spirit of this and then all the other, um, another paper that the author mentioned. And there is differentiation between this paper and the prior literature in that the model introduces a stochastic uh, productivity rate and rigid dependent expert exit rate, such that um, the model fits the data pretty well. And the paper also uses a novel strategy to solve a numerical problem using neural network to facilitate a solution uh, with the economic conditions as regularizers, which has not been seen in the literature prior. Uh, the contribution, I think, uh, are manifold. The model seems to alleviate the tension uh, between amplification and persistent crisis while the prior models have to juggle with the caveats, the caveats are namely, uh, for one side, risk aversion. Uh, to fit the data is usually set very high to generate high unconditional risk premium. But however, uh, this simultaneously reduces expert leverage in the normal times, which would make the crisis probability and duration of the crisis very, very low, which is contrary to the data. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the old literature, um, you know, uh, as, as well as the benchmark model in the paper that the author presented, it's clear that the prior models successfully generated nonlinear jump at the boundary between the normal and the crisis state, but the higher the amplification effect, also the higher the uh, conditional risk premium, which induces experts to buy and invest during the crisis state, resulting a, in a very speedy recovery because of this. And the other uh, major contribution is, of course, to use the feedforward neural network to conduct numerical analysis. Uh, here are a couple of minor comments, uh, which are, you know, nothing major, but I think uh, could be a good extension of the model. So compared to the richer setup in, in uh, He and Chris Murthy in 2019, where the, mo the model in the economy with three types of agents, one is intermediaries, one is producers and households. So this paper actually follow uh, Bruno Meyer and Senekov that they use experts in the households, which I find um, a little bit less intuitive since you're thinking of experts as financial sector uh, who has a higher productivity rate than the households. 
So um, I would like to see if uh, in the future you can incorporate a richer model, which uh, you know uh, constitutes an intermediary set, which is uh, you know conduct a financial flow of the assets and also producers who uh, produce manufactured goods, and then you have a household holding all these assets. On the exit rate, um, I think one innovation in the model is that there is an exogenous exit rate of experts. Uh, this seems to be a very crucial device that uh, you use to, you know, uh, speaks to the resolution of tensions uh, among, you know, the uh, persistence and also the, um, you know, uh, the severity of the crisis. But however, the exit rate is understood to be default, uh, if I'm uh, not mistaken. So realistically, this is equivalent to, you know, ac expert capital value falls under a threshold. For example, you know, dead value or required capitalization rates, for example. Um, instead of arranging a re regime dependent but exogenous exit rate and, you know, um, and exiting experts into households, is it possible to have a fraction of experts exit because um, a capital falls below a threshold uh, under capitalized or or since the model regime change is endogenously determined, is it possible to have the exit rate also endogenized? So, um, and also when you when you uh, parameterize your exit rate in your in your data, it seems like that you use a ex post uh, observation of you know uh, two numbers. I think is forty percent ish in the crisis state, which ex post. Um, this, by the way, offers no hope for preventive policies as uh, as policy indication, because the social planner cannot estimate. The, uh, the expected exit rate in a, in a citizen like state. And also since it is fixed, uh, there's no, you know, there's no measure can be can be used with respect, respect to this channel. So um, in reality setting, I think uh, one more be uh, more interested in how social planners can explore pre preventive policies such that the exit rate is manageable, uh, you know, the default rate, basically. And hence the severity of the duration of the crisis state can be reduced. Um, and since you're uh, highly cited this paper, this paper talks about policy implications. And, uh, you know, if you can endogenize exit rate, it would be interesting to see the policy implications for this. And the crisis duration is another uh, contribution that uh, the paper makes that matches the data pretty well. Um, but of course, um, is it pretty clear from the paper and the prior literature that how to define uh, crisis duration is, you know, much of an art and a science. Um, and it really depends on the definition of a recession, how you define it. So rather, rather than using ad hoc number, you know, ex exposed, is it possible to parameterize uh, it in the model? So for example, you use AK uh, you know, production technology, is it possible to parameterize for, uh, you know, growth rate of the technology for uh, constantly between, uh, below a percentage, for example. And uh, lastly, a new network, I think it's a very innovative way to use, you know, the simple uh, feed-forward network with small units and boundary connections and regularizers. Um, it's uh, quite innovative. And it also distinct from typical, uh, you know, new network, a new network application, since this is not a strictly learning problem without uh, a proper prior, you know, feed everything uh, into the system. But rather, uh, your model provides a prior. There's no need to consider or fitting all the other related problems. Um, but just one small point that you state, uh, stated in the paper that um, using time function um, as activation instead of relu, you know, uh, to avoid vanishing and exploding gradient problem, but you know, uh, that's contrary to, to the literature and Apericus that actually time is prone to such issues, uh, exactly why relu is used um, uh, and more popular um, in, in the current literature. You can uh, look at the, the you know, shape of the, of the function uh, uh, that would make it pretty clear. And also to avoid over uh, gradient problems, you can uh, adjust the learning rate at the same time. So basically, if you look at the time function, why this is prone to the such problem is because if you look at the tail of the function, uh, moving a small step using a small learning rate, the derivative uh, is not going to move much. That's why uh, the model find it uh, hard to converge. But whereas you use a ReLU function, you know, you only have two derivatives, so zero and one. So it is easy and also uh, quick um, compared, to, compared to the more uh, elaborated functions. Um, but all in all, I, I think it's very interesting in the form of paper of, with tons of information and uh, intricacies uh, that you can explore and exciting application in your network. And I think it, one of the striking features of the paper is the excellent match with the data 
Uh, but I, you know, hope to see more work on on, on the model uh, extensions that incorporate more realis uh, realistic settings that uh, could lead to more interesting results and uh, implications. I enjoy it and uh, I learned a lot along the way. And thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot. It was a great discussion. Um, if I have a couple of minutes, maybe I can touch on the comments. Is it okay, Marcus? So what I would propose, I will thank all the participants, but because the next talk will be, or um, the keynote address will be mm -hmm. in 30 minutes, we can just leave this room open and everyone who would like to stay to discuss uh, can do it. And you can also use the time to, to continue the discussion. Um, so. Thank you everyone for the presentation. This was a great session. Um, and I hope you uh, will stay to enjoy the rest of the conference. And I just open up the floor for the next 30 minutes to continue. <laughs>